This is not a great camera, but this is a camera with a lot of great memories attached for me. My amazing mom, my awesome dad, bought me this camera in order to support my wish to become a professional photographer around about 2003. And actually it was a little bit more than a wish. I had just landed a staff photographer position that granted I didn't deserve, but I did not own a camera. And that came after a few freelance jobs where I just had to borrow a camera. But I taught myself how to manually set an exposure on this camera. How cool is it that that was even an option on an early consumer digital camera? Not to mention it had video out, live histogram. Cool camera for its day. In a lot of ways. I earned my living with this camera for a full year. Eventually I sold it and put the money toward the purchase of my first DSLR. But feeling nostalgic or something, I happened to run across it for 32 bucks online, plus tax, plus shipping, and I grabbed it. Ultimately, probably like 50 bucks. But you don't get anything for free with a camera like this. You have to work a lot harder. You have to temper your expectations, too. And fine, fair enough, it's not the camera, it's the photographer. But I really kind of don't think that's true until you at least rise to the level of, say, an entry-level DSLR. You have to surpass a certain threshold of quality before snappy, bumper stickerized ideas like that become true. I do agree with the sentiment, though. And this wasn't solely nostalgia. My mom died a few months back, and she was a photographer when she was younger, with a little silver Olympus. Here I am with a little silver Olympus that she bought for me. And although that felt kind of heartbreaking in the moment, ultimately I think it turned out to be a very healing series of walks that I took with this camera. Four or five walks on four or five very different days, but right in the same area. An area I'd never been before. Rather than having art on the brain, I had her on the brain and continuously had to fight the impulse to say, Hey mom, wow, look at that, so pretty. I don't believe she's still there or watching over me or existing or ever coming back in any sense, but it's also not difficult to see why so many do believe that. My brain doesn't know how to process reality without her in it. She's such a part of my software, literally a voice in my head. So yeah, it felt like she was there. But I don't... I don't, in particular, want to amass a collection of cameras. I don't want to have a pretty shelf displaying them. Uh, I think it's cool. I have no problem with that. Beyond that, I think it sucks to think they all end up in landfills, and it's so much better if you're a collector and you will give it love, cherish it, look at it. Better still use it. I'm only interested in using cameras, though. And, um, the reality is, after I take a few walks with this camera, make the video, I'm probably not going to use it that much, or at least this is the conversation I had with myself before I bought it. I wanted another, more um, permanent reason to own this camera, and I gave it a lot of thought, and I feel like I came up with a great answer of what do you do with old cameras, besides the things I mentioned. Well, if it's a more capable camera, a DSLR or something, there are certainly additional options. But for a camera like this, what do you do with it after it's reached the end of its life? Well, here's what I came up with. This past weekend was my wife's birthday. We took photos, but have not seen the photos, nor will we until the following birthday. This camera has become a time capsule. So, starting on her birthday and ending on the next birthday, but beginning again on the next birthday. I'll document her life, our life, and we'll just have to wait to take a look at him, considering 
We're adults and not fucking infants requiring instant gratification. I've been way into this delayed gratification lately. Just an overall frustration with the way things are. Waiting is good. It's good for you. I don't in particular recommend this camera. I don't think it's an unknown gem. I don't think the word classic is ever going to be associated with it. Although it has some definite strengths, I mentioned a few previously, but add to that list a rather impressive zoom range. It originally sold for $599 US, that's 2003 money. Though my parents paid, I looked it up, still have the email, $860. It was a kit they bought, not just the camera alone. It doesn't support interchangeable lenses, but it does have threading where you can screw in lens modifiers or converters. I had one that was a 0.5 wide angle converter and one that was a 2x telephoto. Didn't use the telephoto all that much. The zoom was already so huge, but uh, the wide angle converter I used all the time. The kit I had came with a bunch more cool stuff. A hard shell case, memory cards, rechargeable batteries. I like that this thing runs on regular old double A's. I wish more things did. In a pinch you can find them anywhere. Plus it withstands aging better. You decide to take your old camera out of mothballs, shoot with it again. You're not in the position of trying to track down some whack-ass battery format from decades ago. So that is very much appreciated as a design choice. So don't run out and try to buy this specific camera. I am certainly not advocating for that. Or do, I don't know. It's so cheap as to be basically free and it's tons of fun to shoot on. Also provides a really good photography workout and it's a great palette cleanser. Can't afford the camera you really want? Well, shoot with this for a while, then switch back, and you'll appreciate the camera you already own a whole hell of a lot more. Wish you could afford that Sony a7R5, but you can't. Use this for a week, and the camera you already own will become an a7R5, as if by magic. And here's a thought to chew on. I was thinking about this earlier today. Professional photographers are a bit like professional wrestlers. They make a lot of noise, they make all the money, but they're also somewhat goofy, less respectable than their amateur counterparts, dare I say a little phony. And understand I count myself among those who are phony and less respectable. Plus I mean no offense to pro wrestlers, nor to pro photographers, but I'm just really thankful to have found my way out of that, happy to have become an amateur photographer in the last few years. A hobbyist, at least part-time. It's a much more pure and rewarding experience. Anything without money attached is. Well, yes, I will no doubt agree to come photograph your wedding because I need the money. Or your high school senior portraits. No, of course I don't want to do it. And I really don't want to pretend otherwise, especially on social media. Hashtag love my job, y'all, tee hee hee. I need you, you need me, you need my experience, I need your money, dear potential client. But it's a job. I'll do it, but in the process of doing it, I'm going to feel similar to how you probably feel about doing your own job. For a good solid decade, I simply wouldn't pick up a camera if I wasn't being paid for it, or doing something that could lead to future bookings. And I'm just so eternally grateful to not be in that mindset anymore. It sucked. It took exploring amateur photography to make me fall in love with it again. So these days, when I'm leaving the house with my camera bag, you'll only see me sporting the knee-high, neon orange boots and underpants about 25% of the time. I'm respectable now, brother. Boy, I worked for some fucking goofballs in my time. And after that, with some fucking goofballs. Is this a vocation that attracts the most flamboyant crazy narcissists on the planet i think it is that has been my observation 
the photographer who has to be louder and funnier than the groomsman talk over them. I have worked with that photographer. I know him. The photographer who has to be the center of attention and outdress the bride. I've worked with her. She's a cunt. The photographer with two weeks of experience who, who knows that they're the best of all time and their second shooting for you, which is demeaning, so they insist on jumping in front of your camera during key moments of the wedding. I've worked with them as well, and I've had to resort to physically removing them from the shot on more than one occasion. Was that the best way to handle it? No, probably not. It's especially fun when that same photographer, after ruining your shots, then fails to back up their images and loses them all. And really the story and the level of this person's incompetence only gets more and more unbelievable from there. I mean, it's not as though this really happened to me or anything. But if it had, I think we can all agree, fuck that person. A thousand times fuck you, hypothetical, unnamed person. But these are the realities of sharing space with other humans. You don't have to tolerate their bad behavior, though you probably should in order to not become the asshole yourself. On occasion, I've become the asshole. I hope to never let that happen again, but I do have a bit of a temper, so it's tough. But I guess my point is, all those cliches about bridezillas, my complaining about potential customers and how I can't get overly excited about your job, photographer zillas are a lot more common in my experience, so I actually do appreciate my clients more than I probably indicated earlier. By the way, I fully recognize that these photos are not very good. It was fun to shoot them regardless, but of course they are very, very far from amazing. But to whatever extent I can get away with it, I'd like to blame the camera. The Olympus C750. But secretly I love it. We're actually really good friends, the camera and I.